I was formerly an artist on Bad Boy Records of my ex-partner, went by the name of P. Diddy, Sean Combs. Right about now, they're making a lot of movies and series about these type of guys. How many of y'all, such as myself, grew up with no parents? I watched people die. I genuinely love the Muslims. When I said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah, that was the last day I smoked. I learned a lot about how powerful the Muslims are. Literally went to go make hajj. When I got in the courtroom and realized that I was being implicated in a conspiracy that had nothing to do with me, the nine years I spent in prison, and I just got back. I get the warm up, bro. Oh, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. After a week, it's like, wa alaikum salam. He don't know nothing about Shake Google. It been Twitter, El Instagrammy. That ain't his shake. He don't know that guy. That's your shake. Nah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. My dear brothers in Islam, as the brother mentioned, alhamdulillah, I go by the name of Amir Junaid Muhaddith, formerly known to many of y'all, some of y'all, maybe none of y'all. As Loom, I was formerly an artist on Bad Boy Records, and some of y'all... Many of y'all, maybe none of y'all, are aware of my ex-partner, who went by the name of P. Diddy, Sean Combs, and a host of other names he possessed. As the brother mentioned, my intention and my purpose for visiting the UK and other parts of Europe, because this tour ends, inshallah, somewhere around the 9th or the 10th of March. And I took the effort only because I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm, I'm extremely invested in the youth. I like for that to be known, understood. I'm invested in the youth and the future of the youth because I know what it's like. You know, growing up in the streets in New York, I grew up in the era with drugs, violence, and everything plagued my town. It plagued my community. And we didn't have Islam as a defense. All we had was what we had. And enduring this lifestyle was not by choice. In most cases, it was by circumstance. So when you have situations that are circumstantial, it really doesn't leave you too many options. But unfortunately, in this day and time, many of the Muslims are falling into this lifestyle. And if you look at the environment surrounding the Muslims, a lot of these situations come from choice, not circumstance. Meaning that if I took a toll right now, or poll, by show of hands, how many of you brothers here are born Muslims? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And how many of y'all, such as myself, was guided to this blessed deen of Islam? SubhanAllah. So regardless of how we got here, we here, right? Don't really matter how we got here, we here. But the benefit is some of you who were born... In this blessed deen of Islam, you were nurtured and cultivated upon Tawheed. You came from the womb of a believer. You were conceived by believers. You were raised and cultivated upon this blessed deen of Islam. So that means by the fuddle and the and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you were born under the security of Allah azawajal. And we all know that there's no security that can exceed the security of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, my brothers who were guided to this blessed deen of Islam, we were guided to this security. The only security we knew was the security that we provided for ourselves. We didn't understand the security of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We understood security being 
have an ability to fight, have an ability to shoot, have an ability to stab or inflict any type of pain or injury on an individual solely for the purpose of securing our own person and the things we love. So the reality is when a person who was born under this mercy chooses to abandon the security of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose a lifestyle that is in complete opposition of the life you know and the security that you've grown accustomed to. And when you look at it this way, hopefully you reflect that the abandonment of this security and the consequences that come with it is self-inflicted. And when a judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lands upon you, you have nobody to blame but yourself. So, now for us who are guided to Islam, and by Allah's mercy, we learn what this security is, and we learn to embrace and adhere to the security that's being provided by us, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we abandon the security, then we have no excuse at all. We have no excuse as well, right? So as I mentioned, it don't matter how we got here, we here. You understand? Because I want to dispel the notion that there's some difference between those who are born Muslim and those who are guided to Islam. Because a lot of times we, we, we plague ourselves with this type of civil strife, thinking that someone born a Muslim is better than someone who's guided to the Islam. Or there's some difference in what obligations we're given in this blessed deen, whether you were born understanding these things or you were guided to understanding these things. The reality of it is we have no excuse for the law subhanahu wa ta'ala if we abandon this security, if we abandon this religion, if we abandon the fuddle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the one thing we have in common, regardless of how we arrived, that we have a common enemy. And that enemy is the shaitan, and this dunya. This is the commonality we share, regardless of what country you came from, where your parents may have left and landed, where you may establish your first understanding of this blessed deen of Islam, we have a commonality that we share. We have enemies that are known, and we have some that are unknown. But the ones that are known, we know together. Regardless of how we got here, we know that the shaitan, is a clear enemy of the son of Adam. And we also understand that this dunya, this dunya, this dunya don't want you. You want the dunya. You never read a narration where the dunya wants you. You always read about a person's whims and desires leading him to crave and yearn for the dunya. And the sad thing about it, yeah, Iquan, is becoming widespread amongst the Muslims. Many of the Shabab, I come from America. I'm pretty sure y'all peep into the media and things that's going on in our country. I pay attention to all the affairs of the Muslims. It doesn't matter what country it is. Because I love the Muslims. But I'm not too far from a state called Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the most sought after, predominantly Muslim States in the United States of America. And right now, Philly is like the murder capital of the United States of America. And the majority of the crimes are being committed, are being committed by Muslims, and the victims of these crimes are Muslims. I visited Minnesota not too long ago, predominantly Somali community, Muslims. Muslims. Businesses on every corner, a buyer shops, thobe shops, restaurants. I mean, the presence is there. The identity is clear. 
Muslims are here. But now these communities are being divided by gangs, Muslim gangs. What yad be left? Explain to me, my dear brothers, how can a person have an allegiance to Allah and his messenger and then have an allegiance to something else that is in complete opposition of Allah and his messenger? It's impossible. How could one have an allegiance to Allah and his messenger and at the same breath you claim a set, you claim a street, you claim a color of a rag? Somewhere down the line, you're going to have conflict. Somewhere down the line, you're going to have a discrepancy between one of these two allegiances. And when that time comes, you're going to have to pick a side. You're going to have to pick a side. You can either fall victim to the peer pressure of that gang or that crew at the expense of Allah's anger. At the expense of Allah's anger, you can choose an allegiance to something that's in complete opposition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa At the expense of earning the anger and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can choose this allegiance and die upon that. And never get the opportunity to gaze upon your Lord. These are things that I'm investing in because I see, like I said, many of the youth falling into these affairs and it's not circumstantial. It's by choice. You are choosing to throw away your Islam for this dunya. You are choosing to throw away your Islam from a lifestyle that you've never been exposed to. It's never been taught in your homes. It's not something that you witness your father, your uncles, or no one have to endure unless they endured it by choice as well. I know what it's like to live in an environment where there's no choices. My father was never there. My mother fell victim to drugs. My grandparents raised me. I watched people die funeral after funeral to the point I got numb. Funerals when I was growing up became fashion shows. We only went there to see what each other was wearing. The person in the box didn't even matter anymore. We were trying to get at his girlfriend because he's no longer with her. He's gone. When When this stuff becomes normal, any sane person will realize that this is not real. This is not life. And when I see Muslims falling into this situation... It breaks my heart because I know what Allah guided me to. When Allah guided me to this religion in December 2008, when I said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah, that was the last day I smoked, that was the last day I drank, I haven't listened to the radio since. And I don't say that to boast or to brag, I say it out of gratitude because I'm grateful for what you had your whole life. I'm grateful to have what you had your whole life. How many of y'all by show of hands grew up with both your parents in the house? SubhanAllah, y'all like superheroes where I come from. Y'all like superheroes. Y'all are abnormal where I come from. You grew up with both your parents? You might have a kid in my neighborhood kill you just for that, out of jealousy. Because you got both your parents. How many of y'all grew up in single homes, single parent homes? It's crazy. I can't even see y'all hands. That's amazing. May Allah bless your mother or your father, whoever raised you alone. How many of y'all, such as myself, grew up with no parents? Allahumma barik haki. Yeah, my grandparents raised me. May Allah have mercy on them both. My grandfather, he passed at 96 years old. He took his shahada before he died. I came home from prison. My grandmother was fighting fourth stage cancer. Died at 91 upon Islam. She took her shahada before she died. 
When I watched the rest of my family grieving, they couldn't understand why I didn't have any grievances. One, because I was fortunate to have these people in my life my entire life. And then on top of that, I may have an opportunity to meet them again in Jannah. While my family's falling apart. They would think that a Muslim is crazy to be overwhelmed with joy on account of death. You see how this Islam work? This Islam is serious. People falling apart. Hair falling out, teeth falling out, just losing weight. And we rejoicing. I mean, we have our moment of grievance. But when it's all said and done, we get to make dua for this person. We get to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this person grave spacious. We ask Allah to enter this person into this paradise that he created solely for the believers. When I look at my family, I got one supplication for them. May Allah guide you. Many of you born Muslim don't understand that. I mean, I have family gatherings. Even if you got the cousin that barely pray or the uncle who may drink hummer. Inshallah, nine times out of ten, you'll meet them in Jannah. When I see my family gatherings, I'm trying to find ways to avoid many of the practices that they've been practicing traditionally for generations. I'm the oddball now. I used to be the life of the party. Now when my family have gatherings, I'm the oddball. This is why I love the Muslims. I traded in a whole bunch of multi-millionaire fake fraudulent people to sit amongst you Muslims and call you my brother. There was a time it would have been extremely hard to even get in proximity of me in my previous career. You might have caught an elbow, got punched in your mouth, draw down, pistol, yo, not too close, man, you too close. Now I travel all over the world by myself. Only with the security of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see thousands of brothers. And I think that we all need to start doing this kind of math. You need to start looking at things exactly for what they are and not let this dunya trick you. Not let this worldly life trick you. You are the best of the people for the people. For some of us, that sounds like an impossible task to live up to. But Allah made it easy for you to be the best of the people for the people. Meaning your example is the best example for the people. You know why? Because we follow the best example of mankind. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So to be the best of the people for the people means all of these different alternative things that the Muslims are falling into, you're abandoning your post. You're abandoning your obligation. You're abandoning the opportunity to contribute to this blessed religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Islam don't need you. You need Islam. Allah doesn't need you. You need Allah. The Sunnah doesn't need you. You need to follow the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these reminders start with myself. And I extend it as your brother so that you understand what you already know. You've heard these things repetitively through all your lives. Sometimes coming from a different mouth or a different perspective may benefit the believer, inshallah. But the reality of it is, without sacrifice, as the brother mentioned, 
wasn't really much of a sacrifice. Traveling across the Atlantic Ocean is not a big deal. Wasn't a big deal. But the stories that I heard before I came across this ocean, that was a big deal. I heard stories of knife violence. I heard stories of gangs. I heard stories of Muslims assaulting other Muslims, murdering other Muslims. Disrespect of the parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put dutifulness to the parents right after his right to be worshipped. Right after his right to be worshipped alone, he put dutifulness to the parents. I can't even imagine someone who nurtured and cultivated you upon Tawheed, nurtured and cultivated you upon Islam, that you have the audacity to raise your voice, raise your hand, or anything disrespectful. I know non-Muslim parents that'll break your back in half for disrespecting them. When I heard these stories, this is what became a difficulty for me. I used to live here. I moved here before. I lived in Brixton. When I first came to Brixton in 2005 as a rapper, I was bumping into guys. There was a couple guys. It was a part of this little crew called SMS. So these guys, the, the, the British tough guys, mashallah, right? But then I come back in 2009, majority of these guys was Muslim. And I was amazed. And in this particular part of London, East London, it's like, Driving through a Muslim country. I brought my wife and my daughter here. It's their first time in London. I'm looking at them at the window. The whole drive here, as soon as we got into East London, my wife might have looked at about 15 buyer shops. You already know where that's going. If any of you marry, you know what's, that, you know what's going down. i would be glad, inshallah, I'll get out of here. All them stores is closed, and we had to find another day to do some window shopping, inshallah. But wallahi, I love the Muslims. You know, I love the Muslims. I love what Allah love. That's what puts your emotions in check. When you find yourself taking something personal that has nothing to do personally with Allah, then your emotions is in the wrong place. Your emotions in the wrong place. You put the love with Allah love. Hate with Allah hate. Now your affairs is in order. Now you ain't got to be running around here imitating some belligerent individual who doesn't understand how to gauge his emotions. And you definitely don't want to fall into a situation where you lack the control of your emotions. May Allah make us all better. But as a man, if you find yourself losing control of your emotions and don't know where to put them, remember to love what Allah love and hate what Allah hate. And I guarantee you, your emotions will be in the right place. My dear brothers, I want to take this time out, inshallah, to engage you in the conversation that's going to require you to talk back to me. I'm not up here just to run my mouth. I want to hear your voice as well. Because it's important to me. I benefit from this. I learn from brothers. I learn about the plights of the Muslims. And I supplicate to Allah and ask them for guidance and ask them for the means to contribute to the rectification of the affairs of the Muslim. Because we all have a part. Many of y'all just love to break the Iman back or just break the Sheikh back, take everything. Oh, ask the Sheikh, ask the Sheikh. Don't ask me, ask the Sheikh. The Sheikh is overwhelmed. Well, y'all gonna lift some of the burden off the Sheikh. You understand this religion? It's upon Allah. Y'all send someone way across town to a dawa table instead of just giving the person dawa right there, right? Y'all quickly send somebody to YouTube. 
This segment right here is about accountability. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu said we are all shepherds, right? And every shepherd will be held accountable for his flock. And accountability, responsibility, all of these are characteristics and traits of men. Because we on man time right now. Yeah, we on man time. Alhamdulillah. How many of you brothers can explain to me what is a man of virtue? What is a man of virtue? We on man time. There you go. Hold up. You too young to be getting up that slow, man. <laughs> Uh, Shafak Allah, Yaqi, F1. Forgive me, man. Nah. Barakallahu fi. Jazakallahu khair. There's a statement in Imam al-Bukhari. He said, Al-ilmu qabla qawli bil amal. Knowledge precedes speech and actions. Right? So it's not permissible for a Muslim to speak or act without knowledge. Barakallahu fi. That was, that was amazing. He, he actually... Took the answer from about five of y'all. I would have went around, just got one from him, the other four from somebody else. That's what I mean by lifting the burden from your brother. But we ain't over. This ain't over. He explains some of the virtues of a man of virtue. Can anybody describe to me? An actual man of virtue. Do any of y'all actually know? A man of virtue? There you go. Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu wa salam. The most virtuous man that ever walked this planet. Subhanallah. Now the sad thing about many of the Shabbat They've taken on role models who possess no virtue. Only the accolades that come with this dunya. And some of them to raise them to a status that doesn't even come close to true men of virtue. True men of virtue is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his companions. And those that follow them, and those that follow them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, خَيْرُ nas قَارُنِي ثُمَّ لَدِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَدِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best generation is my generation, and those that follow them, and those that follow them. It's amazing when you have such a beautiful example and I'm saying this to y'all who've been born Muslim. Because growing up in the environments I grew up in, the men that I deem to be virtuous, they possessed some of the characteristics that the brother mentioned. They were men of their word. They stood on their word, you know. They tried to implement some level of, you know, consistency in their characteristics, their speech and their actions, but it was all bottle. It was all revolved around something that man created. A lifestyle that no human being can fully live up to. 
Because even those guys, when the situation got tight, they folded just like a beach chair. And they had a bunch of us believing that they were immortal. We thought they was them dudes. They had everything. They had cars, they had jewelry, they had respect, they had fear, they had all these things. But when the walls came crashing down, they got on that same stand that they claimed they would never get on and point across the whole courtroom and say he did it. How disappointing it was to grow up looking at these guys like they meant something. May Allah guide them. But when you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you look at his companions, these are men of virtue, Yehuah. These are men you want to be like. Trust me. I've been, all, I've been to six different continents. I've been everywhere except Antarctica. And I rub shoulders with organizations that right about now, they're making a lot of movies and series about these type of guys. Y'all even got to show Gangs of London. SubhanAllah. You know? But true virtue I've only seen through the example of the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. For the youth, don't be led astray by these individuals who created this lifestyle that looks real shiny, looks real appealing. Don't fall into these traps. Y'all know your brother Amir just spent nine years in federal prison. Nine years. I put that lifestyle so far behind me. I was living in Egypt at the time, studying at a couple of Moroccans. I had just signed up for the Rasul Khas in um, Jamia Tel Azar. Literally went to go make Hajj. Came back to Egypt, dropped off the gifts that I got for my family, and immediately turned around back to the airport to go to Belgium to give a talk. And I just got back, like two and a half years ago. When I got in the courtroom and realized that I was being implicated in a conspiracy that had nothing to do with me, but during my Rule 11 hearing, I listened to this prosecutor try to paint a picture that was not even remotely close to the truth. This woman said that I was traveling around the world glorifying my past. Glorifying my past and influencing children. It was just ridiculous. And now I look at this brother, may Allah protect him. I was actually in the process of having a conversation coordinated with another brother that we know mutually. And I hear how, you know, once he took his shahada, that same trick bag, this man is sitting in prison right now with no charges. So if you learn anything from this, that tells you that this Islam is powerful. That Allah's deen is powerful. And those that possess knowledge and understanding and implementation of this religion, you are powerful. So trying to imitate anything other than the Prophet Wasallam and his companions, you are fighting a losing battle. And you are actually doing the work of the shaitan. But the shaitan don't care about the individuals who go astray. He's pleased with you. 
The shaitan loves the individual who delays or rejects the salah. He loves the one who drinks or smokes intoxicants. He loves the ones that commit zina. He loves the one who pledge allegiance to other than Allah and his messenger. He loves the one that spills the blood of the believer, dishonors the, you know, dishonor the believer. He loves these things. But the moment you start to become the best of the people for the people, now you cooking. Now you on the right path. And only then you will learn who your true enemies are. The ones that were unknown before, they will become known. And you will accumulate this enmity based upon you obeying your Lord. Simply just obeying your Lord and obeying the messenger that he sent, you will become a hot topic. You will become a detriment to the establishment of the shaitan. Wallahi adeem. The nine years I spent in prison, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about Islam. I learned, I learned a lot about how powerful the Muslims are. When I was in prison, the Muslims were the most loved, the most feared, and the most respected. We governed ourselves. We didn't have a lot of outside visitors, imams coming in, you know, Qurans being, you know, given to us and charity, none of that. And if it was taking place, they never let us see it. They tried everything to discourage us. But we remain firm. The brotherhood that we established, that was all the family we needed. For some of the brothers that never got visits, never got letters, never got phone calls, none of those things, they were pleased. Because when they looked around, they had brothers. And that was sufficient. Every year of Ramadan, those people tried to discourage us. They were either late with Sahur, Late with iftar, it was always some complication. But they never got a peep out of us, never got a complaint. Because all we would do is just go in our locker and allocate whatever food we had, and we enjoyed our Ramadan. And they continued to try. I remember one time, me and the brothers, we were going to uh, Jumu'ah, we would use the, um, the chaplain. You know, it's a multi-purpose room they use for every religion other than the laws. And for some reason, they decided that we wasn't going to have Juma. It's about 90 of us out there. When they realized after all of the authoritative commands they were hurling around and nobody was moving, they changed their minds without us saying anything. They just saw the look in our eyes and the desire that we had to worship Allah and somebody came and opened that door. And this is how it was. So when you come home from that and you see the things that you see going on with the Muslims, like I said earlier, it's heartbreaking because we didn't have the ensemble of means to produce the strength that we were able to establish in the environment that was in complete opposition of the Muslims. And this is why a lot of brothers, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. This is why a lot of brothers end up going back to prison. I've seen brothers return because of the lack of brotherhood, the lack of being received when they come home. Because we had it structured. Just to give you an idea. You know, I was entrusted with 
the position of the imam. One uh, um, compound, I was the head of the security. We had structure. We had an emir that would speak to the establishment. And that, that shielded the imam from having to have any words with the administration. All he had to do, he was entrusted with the affairs of the religious affairs of the Muslims. That's it. He led the salat. You know, he gave the khutbah, so on and so forth. The emir would go talk to the administration. The sharif, he was head of the security. Anytime the Muslims had problems, we went to him. He went with his little team. They went and straightened things out, and that was it. We had a wakil in each block. We had a Beitu Mal in each block. So if a brother get off the bus, he didn't have nothing. All he had to do was go in his dorm, find the Muslims. The Muslims would pull a bag out this big. Sweatsuits, food, everything. It was a certain type of brotherhood. Their brother's witness in the prison. And I've heard stories of these same brothers. They come home. They come to the masjid. They get the warm air. Ah, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. After a week, it's like, wa alaikum salam. They're not used to that. Brothers asking for jobs, asking for help. Sitting in the masjid that just raised maybe $100,000 last night. And I asked y'all brothers a week ago just to give me a job. It's a lot of discouragement that comes with, you know, what's going on in these two different worlds on the same planet. Some of the brothers, they're a little aggressive. You know, I can you know, see in the system, man, who's, who's a Wali? Like, I, you can't run up on nobody asking no brothers. You know, the brothers are crazy, though. They, 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 they want to get married, you know. They may have a whole different approach, though. You know, coming out of a testosterone-driven environment. But the reality of it is, it was like, there's a certain level of brotherhood that was established in a place where it was needed. But then I asked myself, where is it needed the most? Right? Where is it needed the most? Cut to the law, they end up in prison and they find this thing. But we got brotherhood out here. But a lot of us are losing our youth. So in closing, I want to be mindful. I want you guys to be mindful. The elders and the youth. That brotherhood that I'm talking about, it wasn't no age thing. We had older brothers that were serving life sentences, 30 years old, and we respected them because they was our elders. We respected them because they were our elders. And we treated them better than our own fathers because many of us didn't have Muslim fathers. So this older brother that was Muslim, we treated him better than we treated our fathers. It was a certain level of respect, and the elders never talked down to the youth. They gave the same respect in return. You almost felt like you could be a peer with a 70-year-old man, with a 60-year-old man, that you can talk to him like one of your peers. Now we have this generational gap. How many of y'all by show of hands was born in a Muslim country? So a lot of y'all second generation. How many of y'all born in the, uh, in the UK? See? That's where the gap come in. Because now you experiencing things that your dad, you think he old school. Because he done came from the Muslim land with all these Muslim traditions and everything like that. And you out here in this dunya acquiring an a education from a second set of parents. You know the second set of parents is the dunya. And you feel like your parents, is, they, like, they don't know nothing. So you don't consult them. But who do you go consult? Your peers, right? Just as dumb as you. Let's be real. That's where peer pressure is. That's where the pressure comes from. Peer is understandable, but the pressure come in where you asking somebody who's exactly the same age as you, got the same experience as you is, asking him for something or to advise you of something that neither one of you even experienced. Right? 
And there's always one that step up to the plate like he actually knew something too. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? You know, if you take a left and go straight, first roundabout, like he want to give you directions. Have you in a dead end. Know where to turn, know where to go, right? That's why they call it the blind leading the blind, right? Dumb leading the dumb. Could you imagine asking your peer or telling your peer before you tell your dad that you just reached puberty? Like what we supposed to tell you? What kind of sit down discussion y'all supposed to have? Yeah? And truth be told, whenever you run into a situation while you're running around with your peers, the first one you call when you jammed up is who? The person that you leave in the blind, your dad. He don't know nothing about Shake Google. It been Twitter, El Instagrammy. That ain't his shake. He don't know that guy. That's your shake. Y'all purposely leave them oblivious to social media. You don't invite them to learn or understand some of the things that you're experiencing. So what happens? They came here to work to give you a better life. You probably see each other maybe eight, eight hours out the month, right? Come in the house, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam, how's school, how's Quran class, and that's it. You're working, they tired. Y'all be ready for them answers too. Now, Jay, alhamdulillah, it's good. Quran, good. Y'all never volunteered to talk to your fathers. They be trying to reach out. They be trying to figure y'all out. Y'all leaving them blind. Inshallah, man. May Allah make us better, man. May Allah increase us in that which is pleasing to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to place his fadl and his bounty upon this blessed Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah rectify the affairs of the Muslims in every land. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria. Bless our brothers in Philistine. Bless our brothers in all the Muslim lands and the non-Muslim lands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm upon his blessed sunnah of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah unite our hearts upon good, upon good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this brotherhood, this brotherhood that comes with Islam, may he fortify it and make it a resemblance of the brotherhood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us the best of the people for the people. Subhanak Allahi wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk barakallahu feekum wa jazakum Allah khair assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um inshallah i'm your brother amir and i'm not a sheikh i'm not a طالب العلم any of that i'm just your brother amir who flew across the Atlantic ocean to sit with our brothers because i love the muslims i genuinely love the muslims I don't see no biasness, no disconnect by way of ethnicity, race, any of that. I don't care if you was born Muslim, guided to Islam, you Muslim, you my brother. You understand? And I believe that if we all implement this understanding, you'll see the same things that I see. And inshallah, Allah will give us victory because it's promised. And we know that the speech of Allah is true. But we got to ask ourselves, what part are we going to play in all of this? Are we going to stand on the sidelines and wait till the Muslims is winning and then jump and join in? Or are we going to create that victory for the generation that's coming? Because it's really on y'all. The fate of this generation is the fate of the generation that follows. And wherever the elders or people like myself have failed, you have the opportunity to correct and pass down nothing but benefit to the generation that's coming. Real quick, the youth is two kind of leaders in this world. Can anybody tell me? Real quick. And I'm going to leave y'all alone. 
There's two kind of leaders. Anybody can tell me. He said, one that takes initiative and one that's chosen to lead. Let's close. The truth is, I'm going to give you the answer. Yeah, something like that. I'm saying the leader is the leader that is following the rules of Islam, and that one that hasn't followed the rules of Islam. He real hot. He close. The truth is there's those that lead and those that mislead. They both are leaders. Those that lead and those that mislead, you're still a leader. It's just that the reward for the one that leads, like the brother said, upon that which is correct, then this is the praiseworthy leader. He leads upon the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah with the faham of the, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And the one that misleads, leads people astray, in the opposite direction of the path that, that Allah and his messenger prescribed for the believers, but he receives no reward. He receives the punishment and anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he incurs the punishment of all those that he misled. So those that lead and those that mislead, you have to choose which one you want to be. You want to be one that lead upon good or you want to lead in a direction that is contrary to the leadership of the best of all mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakallah khair.